with Dr. Dan French, who is coming at us from, uh, from the Pacific Coast there in California. So, Dan, thanks so much for making time to come on the show today. And, yeah. uh, and you've got a very interesting backstory. What was, I, I find uh, what a very interesting and for me because you, you mix humor with health, and you've also had a health transformation yourself. Um, could you tell us a little about your backstory? Sure. Yeah, I'm originally, I'm originally from Kentucky, and uh, you're in Spain, so I don't know. Like I, I tell people, well, I, I travel and do stand up, and I tell people, oh, oh, I think we're breaking up a little. That's sometimes Skype does that. Hello, hello. Looks like we've frozen Skype here. <laughs> Little Skype problems. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. Skype problems. Okay. Uh, okay. I always tell my wife, I always jokes with me, it takes half the time to get set up. And, uh, so cool. Yeah, how, how, how dare this uh, technology that goes <laughs> around the world in four seconds not function perfectly. That's right. I'm, I'm with you. All right, let's let's let me just go jump back, st- just restart that so it'll yeah. be easier to easier to have to edit it. So okay, so we are live on the Metabolic Motivation Show. Uh, super excited to have Dr. Dan French, um, who combines health and uh, and humor. And uh, so Dan, welcome to the show, and uh, thanks for coming on. And would love maybe you could start off and just tell us a little about your backstory. Uh, sure. A while back, I lost a lot of weight. I lost 125 pounds, and which I tell people is like losing a chubby jockey <laughs> or a ballerina who ate a biscuit or maybe a supermodel with a deep thought. That's what I lost. <laughs> That's and, and I got interested in it. I'm a stand-up comic uh, as part of what I do. I'm also a comedy writer, but I started telling jokes about losing weight on stage. And people laughed, but more interestingly, I started to have a lot of people come to me after the shows. And they'd be like, hey, that was really funny. Uh, what did you actually do to lose that weight? Right. You know, they were really actually interested in the, in the answers. And it's funny here in America because they, it's almost like at first they were suspicious. Right. Like, what you, would you do to lose that weight? That's not natural. Right. <laughs> this is, this wow. is America. We don't lose weight. <laughs> right. Oh, that's that's fascinating. So people were actually thinking, you know, there must be some ulterior, you know, stealth method or something. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's it's America. They think that you bought the weight loss somehow. Right. You know, you, usually they mean, you know, did you get bariatric surgery? Right. Did you get, you know, lap band and things like that? Yes. And, uh, so it just it, it, it sort of snowballed where people wanted more information. And so I ended up writing a full 75 minute one person show about losing weight in modern cultures. Like, how do you actually do that? Right. Wow. Fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, what, you know what? Well, why don't we explore just a little bit of that? What did, what was the, uh, what was the genesis of that, uh, of your, of your weight loss effort? Well, I was, I was past 40 when I first started losing weight and I was overweight my whole life. And, you know, a lot of people will gain weight and then they'll be like, you know, they, they, late in life they'll gain weight. And I weighed 300 pounds uh, when I was in my early 40s and I'm bald, short and white. That's not a good look. That's basically a snowman, <laughs> <laughs> which doesn't really work for anybody. And so... What I had to realize is I'm 40, I have a PhD, I, I, I think for a living, uh, but I know nothing about human physiology or food or biochemistry or nutrition. Why am I, I had no idea really why I was overweight. Everybody's just like, you know, I, I, eat, I eat too much, that must be it. And I realized at that point that I was ignorant. And you would think, I'm originally from Kentucky which is one of the most redneck states in the world, you would think I would have recognized ignorance a little bit earlier, but I didn't. And I realized I, I should not be in charge of my own eating because I can't do it very well. You know, I just did not know what I was doing. So I dove into the internet and started teaching myself about alternative nutrition. Right now, how that was you, really the main thing. Yeah, well, good for you, man. Congratulations. How, how did you discern the, uh, you know, the... Good, the good information from the, um, you know, from the many, many scams out there. Because that's one of the things I've, you know, I've been in this since 1990, 
uh, on and off professionally and, and uh, done some few other things. But one thing that's been a constant is the amount of scams. There's probably more scams right, right, right now than, than ever, you know, with weight loss. How did you discern those as someone who wasn't, you know, wasn't really prof- a professional in this? Ooh, looks like we've got another Skype free, uh, Skype freeze. <laughs> hello, hello. Can you hear me? I, oh, there you are. Okay, sorry. There, now we're back. <laughs> the, the, the gods of Skype are, are uh, having a battle today between somewhere between between California and Spain. <laughs> it's the day after Thanksgiving. They're too full to really you know function well. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Well, speaking of, of full, we were just mentioning a lot of a lot of the weight loss stuff on the internet is actually full of it. You know, full. And uh, so, how did you discern that? You know, what was the, well, good, the good stuff? Yeah, yeah. I think the problem with, you know, Americans in general is that we've seen so much scam stuff uh, coming to us through our media. You, you basically learn that you can't trust the media. You know, everything's a sales pitch in the media, right. which is weird when you think about it. My PhD is in rhetoric, which is the study of public discourse. Yes. Like, how do we talk to each other in public uh, through m- major public forums? And... We've got the greatest communication system ever invented by any human being in all of history, and we use it to tell, you know, to sell Twinkies and to tell lies. Yeah. So people people don't trust it. And so what I did, the very first thing I did was just completely anything that's coming from an American corporation, it's a lie. Yeah. It's a scam. Period. The food, you know, the first thing I did really was I spent a year. Where I'm like, I'm not going to eat anything made by an American corporation. Oh, that's great. The, so it was the anti-corporate diet, and that's a pretty good, pretty good darn yeah. way to start. <laughs> yeah, you're pretty safe by going, you know, across the board. <laughs> if it's made for me by some company, a collection of people that I don't know, uh, it's not going to be safe because I'm not going to eat it. You know, wow. and I tell people on the show, you know, our food, American food, makes people fat no matter where it goes. You know, we 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 export <laughs> oh, yeah. it all over the world. You could drop this food in the middle of the Sudan. And come back six months later, and they'd all be big-bellied rednecks. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's our food. Oh, that's great. That is, that is so true, man. That's uh, uh, I've seen it here in Spain. You know, as a traditional Mediterranean diet, uh, I can walk out on the street and I can pick out, you know, the people that are that are eating American-style processed foods, and you can right. see the people either that are eating the traditional, you know, Mediterranean foods, and uh, it's so easy. Great point. Yeah, it's it's pretty – when you start giving people the tools to l- just look around and go, oh, yeah, anybody who eats this food starts to look like, yeah, like a snowman. <laughs> you know, you, your body can't process it. It doesn't fit biochemically with what we're designed to actually eat. So, yeah, that's a pretty easy one. And people react really well to that when you start pointing out how weird that food actually is. Sure. Like I tell people, like you can't even tell me what most of it is. Like Velveeta. You know, well, what is Velveeta? There's no orange cinder blocks in nature that you can just pick up and eat. You right. know, and people don't even know what it is. They don't sure. know how it's made. They don't know what it's made of. So that's where I start. And that's what I start with myself. I'm like, okay, take that off the table and uh, we'll, we'll see what else, uh, what, what happens. Wow. So what, so what about, uh, what about other, other components of, uh, of what you did? Did, as far as maybe exercise or stress stuff or anything else, any? Well, I, I really focused on food. I was living in Austin. I go back and forth between Austin and Los Angeles, and I was dating a vegan at Ooh, the time. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, and that was my first big shift that I remember thinking, well, there's no way you can actually survive an entire day without meat. You know, I've never done that in my entire life, literally, ever. And she kept... She cooked really, you know, she was a great cook. So I tried it for a while and I, I kind of liked the food and I actually realized that you can feed yourself in an alternative way. I'm not vegan now. Like I don't, I don't really believe vegan uh, is natural. Like there's no way you can tell me that we weren't designed to eat other animals. Right. I and mean, they're just, it's just, that's, I don't know why it's that way, but God or the universe or whatever created us was like, okay, I love all of you. You are all my creatures. Now eat each other. You know, there's an organism in caves that eats rock. Right. <laughs> That's crazy. Rock thought it was off the menu. It's like, sorry, rock, you're in the game. 
<laughs> so, so I tried that for a while. I ate vegan for almost a year, and it taught me that I could I could eat differently. Yes. But then I was hanging around vegans, and that didn't feel right. You know, I was like, if you go to a party and you can't decide whether if a fight broke out, the men or the women would win, <laughs> something's, something's wrong. It just doesn't work. Oh, oh man. that's so true. I actually did uh, did an experiment with, um, um, I guess it was six, seven months of, uh, of vegan living, uh, vegan life, vegan eating, and also brought upon by... You know, a similar thing. It was a it was a beautiful woman. Uh, you know, beautiful women have ways of, of getting us men to to be motivated. They do. I've do noticed things, that. Yeah, they? <laughs> it's the beautiful woman diet. That's what we real yeah. all, all we need is like yeah. Yeah, it was that, and you know, and, and try to keep her happy, and, and hope hopefully you know there'll be some be some rewards at the end of the day, you know. So, uh, but I, what I found myself was after uh, I really fe- I felt great um, or better after for a few months. And right. then I gradually started feeling like, you know, just a little off and a little off. And, uh, and, I, and I did, you know, and I do have a background in, in uh, you know, with, in health sciences. And so I do, and I understand, you know, m- you know the ratios of, of hormones and things like that and, and metabolism and how the, you know, you know, all this technical stuff. And I started thinking, you know, something, something just doesn't, um, you know, fit right because, there's a huge thing that's missing. It's like your B12 vitamin is, you know, all your B, your B vitamins are going to be low. There's no good source. Your protein is going to be low. And, right. And um, so anyway, finally I decided to ditch that. And uh, and uh, I think it's a great. I think it's a great transition diet. Yes. Like where, where I'm right, I'm at right now is like if you can get people off the 80 percent of people that are eating horrible food all the time that's being given to them by corporations transition them into some kind of weird alternative plant-based ideology which is strong it's a good persuasive alternative way of eating sure. I mean, it's got all the it's got all the, the animal rights stuff and sustainability and local so it's got a really nice ethical uh, appeal to it and it, and people like that but then once they eat it for a little while if they don't start like you which yeah. is the logical response but I'm not feeling right and I'm hanging around skinny dudes I yeah. gotta try something different. But it's a great transition because it teaches you literally, oh, there's a whole other oh, world yes. of food out there. Right, right. I, yeah, that's a great point. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of positive aspects to it, and uh, no question. I think uh, for, for what, from what my experience now in the last few years is, uh, is, is kind of a is – if you do a, a veggie-heavy paleo thing, that's what I'm seeing is working – for, yeah, yeah, I agree. For ninety percent of people now, I've got a few customers. I do a lot of wellness coaching, and and that includes a lot of nutrition. And a few people, biochemically, you know, people are different. We're all different, right. and some people can can get can do the vegan thing and and apparently get good results. But I know from some a number of people that I've interviewed that have uh, have been have done the vegan thing, and they they have told me that a number of the high level figures actually. Guess what? On the side, they're eating fish, and they're uh, right. you know, and uh, and it's because they need it, you know, and yeah, and so anyway. Uh, oh, and I completely and, agree. And, and eggs I tell as people, well. and I tell people the vegan movement dies the day that all the leadership has to appear in public without their shirts on. <laughs> I mean, you compare the the human body on a complete plant based diet. And the human body on a, you know, like you said, there's enough meat in there, enough meat protein, animal protein, animal organs. And you know, the, and those people work out. You look at the paleo leadership versus the vegan leadership. It's ridiculous. You know, they look like human beings. They have muscle. They look, vi- right. you know, it's just clearly a better diet for the human body. Yeah, no question. I, you know, I have a, I just imagined a, uh, uh, this would be a very comical scene. Imagine, imagine if there was, if we, we were to go back to the Middle Ages and had, there was a battle, <laughs> there was a right. battlefield. And you had well, I've vegan, suggested, the yeah, an army versus the paleo <laughs> army. <laughs> yeah, I've suggested, uh, like at all the paleo events, they should, they should have vegan paleo MMA matches. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is great. 
And like I said, I, I like the vegan community. I think politically they're really good. They're doing a much better job than the paleo community as far as recruitment and sure. promoting their, their ideas. Paleo is so new that it's not really organized yet on a national scale. Right. But there are vegan organizations on college campuses handing out free literature. And, yes. You know, and there's, vegan, there's good vegan horror movies like Food Incorporated, which basically, you know, they're horror films. They show these black and white grainy murder images from, you know, big farm cows and things like that. And of course people are going to be horrified. You know, it's really good rhetoric. It's not really fair rhetoric, you know, to do that to people, but it's effective. Yeah, it's and good Pale propaganda. Paleo doesn't have that yet. Right. It's good. Yeah, it's definitely good propaganda. Well, you know, the, what I've what I I actually uh, have uh, used that film myself as part of just an educational process with customers because it's what because it's it's also really important I, from my experience to, uh, you know, to look at the to look at non farm non, non farm factory, you know, protein sources, you know, so right. grass fed. It's so important, and, and it's something most people have no concept. What you mean? You mean a cow is not so? You mean there's a, a cow can doesn't eat grass? And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm sorry. Most yeah, no, cows it's... do not. They're not fed grass. <laughs> they're you know they're they're fed corn, and uh, so, you know GMO corn and GMO soy. <laughs> well, we're so separated from you know our food in the natural way we get food. I I tell a story in my show about my son when he was eight. We were taking a driving vacation through the Midwest. And at one point, he looks out the window and he says to me, he goes, what's all this green stuff next to the car that we keep driving through? And I'm like, that's corn. You don't, you don't know what corn is? <laughs> you know, if it was a big box of Pop-Tarts, you know, in a field, then you would probably get it. But he literally had no idea what corn looked like. Right. Wow. That's, uh, it's, that's true. It's just we, what, we're, what we don't see, we're not used to. And... Uh... Wow, that's that's fascinating, though. Well, you know, it makes me think about. Uh, I, I once was told by a customer. She said, "Well, you know, I look at. I just look for the boxes, and and if they put a picture that uh, and it says natural, it's got to be good for you, right? You know, a natural picture, <laughs> right? You know, doesn't. I mean, that the government wouldn't let them sell something that wasn't good if it was natural, right? I'm like, <laughs> no, the government is, the government's here to protect you. Yes, <laughs> you can you can trust them. They would never be swayed by." mega organizations giving them billions of dollars a year oh, totally trustworthy totally yeah and that's why in the show when i tell people look i, I literally say my the first thing i did was stop eating everything made by an american corporation and that's not to tear down corporations if they want to switch their food and make it healthy great but the simulated healthy yeah just reject it all and people look at me like well what what would you eat you would starve to death i'm like no there's this stuff called real food it grows out of the ground like green fingers <laughs> yeah. and you can and you can eat that stuff Oops. there you go I'll be back oh, no problem. Temporary, temporarily crazy <laughs> so but you know there's no food education there's no nutrition education there's no cooking education none of that stuff people don't have any of those skills anymore so they're used to being fed and if you're going to let people feed you they're going to do it as cheaply as possible so they can make the most money as possible and you're going to end up where we're at yeah no question so dan from your perspective what is the what is the solution the big solution you know i think partly that's what i say partly what i do with comedy is i go out and i talk to people that don't normally listen to any nutrition information right i do i do i do my show at comedy clubs where people are just showing up to watch comedy and sure. i give them 75 minutes of diet comedy right and, and i'm doing this in the middle of you know the south like i did the show in kentucky and probably 80 percent of the audience is obese right you know and i'm doing fat jokes for them basically for you know an hour and 15 minutes and they're paying to listen so what I find is that if you're really good at the comedy and you make sure it's all funny then they're fine with it uh, and you can slip the message in there and it's it's really interesting to watch what people do I've I had a woman come to me after the show one night and she was she was large I mean easily probably 300 350 pounds and she made a beeline right for me and I thought I'm dead you know I've offended her somehow she's gonna kill me and she walked right up to me and she goes, you gave me some things to think about. She goes, I, I was like, I thought you were going to kill me. She was like, well, I still might. But 
the show is she's like it's fun it's interesting you know people are not getting this information right we all think that because we do podcasts and we we try to get stuff out into the media that it's reaching people but really the podcasts and all these are so narrow it's yes. it's typically the people who are already interested in this stuff right how do you, how do you get it out to the big you know herd of 85 percent of the people in the world that are not getting this information and that's really what i'm trying to do with with the comedy yeah, when hats off to you, man. I think because you're totally onto something. <laughs> you're right. I think there's a lot of times I feel like uh, we are sort of preaching to the crowd. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it's hard. It's hard to get outside. The big media doesn't. I mean, it's owned by the system that wants sure. to pr- keep the system going, which is fine. That's the way it's designed. But to break in there, even people when they we get people from the Palo community get on like Doctor Oz sure. here, and they still restrict what they're allowed to say. And they'll say something, and then the media comes on and goes, "Well, none of this has been proven," and none of you know, because they're so afraid of being sued, I guess, or upsetting their their sponsors. Right. I think the sponsor is the one of the biggest biggest things. I mean, craft, you know, craft foods. Uh, I I had a this was this was back in the early nineties. I was on uh, on I was in Miami and uh, was doing some stuff there with one of the cruise lines and and in the community a little bit and. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm no big famous person at all, but uh, I was on a very local afternoon show uh, for you know for my my famous talk was is how to motivate your metabolism, and uh, and I was told before I went in, well, just but just uh, to try not to talk about any of the brands, uh, right. you know, any of the the companies, because I have some slides that I was using with, that were sort of hammering some of the corporations. <laughs> <laughs> And I was told, yeah, you know, we, we didn't. Yeah, they. Did we tell you this before? Did you know? I'm like, no, I didn't get that memo. And basically, I had to take, I had to like slash half of my material. <laughs> right. Yeah, they get very nervous about that stuff. And it's, you know, most of my show is not negative. Like, even when I go after a corporation, I do it in a friendly way. I'm like, you know, that food is, it's been designed, you know, to make money for companies, and that's why they're there. But you don't have to eat it. I mean, the only sure. thing you can really do ultimately, we can't. You're not going to stop them from making it. Uh, it's just once you switch to other food, they'll make that other food. Right. Oh yeah. No question. You know, the whole organic movement came out of nowhere, and it's basically again. I think it's kind of a propaganda movement. Like mo- much of the organic food isn't you know exactly what it needs to be either. But at least you know there's a clear connection between if you start eating sweet potatoes all the time, and you're like these are the only kind of sweet potatoes I'm going to get. They'll they'll supply that stuff. Yes, yes, good point. Yeah, I think that's I think that's something all of us in the in the health community or you know anyone that's trying to do educational stuff we should keep in mind that that the best thing we can maybe tell people is you vote with your dollars every time you buy you, whatever you buy that's what that's what companies are going to sell you. I mean you know that's that's just the way it is. Yeah, and the, and the last thing you want to do is awaken the sleeping food giant to come <laughs> after you know and they already are like all the backlash against the paleo movement how they. You know, they turn into a caricature about cavemen and, and they restrict what you can say and they're already going after the science and all that stuff. But that's that's kind of the natural rhetoric of we're, we're trying to take away their product. Sure. You know, we're literally, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're, we're a problem for them. That's the way it should be. And ultimately, you'll get enough paleo companies come up and things like that that they can actually compete and there'll be a market for it. But for right now, they're just going to try to crush it. Right. Well, you know, there's there's another subtle way um, about you know historically when you have a uh, an opposition movement. I'm kind of fascinated by the whole the whole power struggles throughout history. It's one of my one of my one of my theme, my themes. I don't know why I like that, but but the uh-huh. other thing the other thing you do though is you is you infiltrate it, and and in, the Romans did this quite often. Uh, here in Spain, the Ro- the Romans needed over 200 years to conquer the whole. Iberian Peninsula, and the reason they needed 200 years was because there were all these individual tribes that would not, they, they were not united, so therefore uh, they couldn't defeat the Romans, but the Romans could not have one battle and defeat them either. Right. So the Romans, what they did is they, they would have to individually, you know, like, subdue each tribe, you know, or buy off the leaders, which is the other way you do it. Um, and, uh, and the other way is you actually, in, you create, uh, you infiltrate people who sort of co-opt the movement, 
you know, and, and split right. it and you split it and then you, you create division, divide and conquer. So all that stuff's going to, you know, is, is certainly going to happen. That's just human history and human, you know, politics and all that. Right. Well, on the other side of what I do, the rhetoric side of it, you know, is really it's really interesting to me to look at that stuff and go, if you're trying to further a movement, if you think this is the answer for people, then how do you do that? And having some kind of central plan for that, where you have everybody like like if you look in politics, you give paleo people talking points. Yes. You give yes. you give them good ways for responding to all the resistances and all the attacks that are going to happen. And right now it's very splintered. There's no real professional media in paleo. Uh, most of the people who are doing it uh, don't have professional media training. Right. So when I watch it, when I watch it from my rhetoric side of things, it's kind of like ah, you know, you're getting these opportunities to break into the media, but you're not using them very well. Yes. You know. How do we create, you know, sort of guru figures and powerful uh, people who are powerful speakers and great at giving the message? The people who are breaking onto Oz, you know, they're doctors. And I know a lot of these guys because I know most of the paleo leadership. And I think they're really good at what they do, but they don't come across on camera as, as super dynamic, you know, like, oh, I'm going to follow this person because they're so amazing. And that's really what you need. Right. My favorite guy is Rob, is, Rob, is Rob Wolf. Yeah. Like, I think Rob is great with the media. He's real smart. He comes across as a regular person. And that's usually, I send people to robwolf.com. I'm like, go listen to his podcast. Check him out if he ever speaks. He's very persuasive. And it just comes across in the right way, I think. Yeah, Rob Rob does a, a really good job. I've uh, watched watched some of his shows. In fact, had um, one of the, uh, we had one of his, uh, a guy that's been on his show a bunch of times, uh, Doc Parsley. Uh, I don't yeah. know if you know, uh, do you, if you know, know him, uh, he was on, we just interviewed, uh, did an interview a few weeks ago and great guy, uh, also. And, uh, so getting back to the, to that theme though, uh, let's, for people that are listening to this, that are, you know, that are in this movement and want to make a difference, maybe you can, can you can make some suggestions about, uh, you know, some of the, the points you just made about, you know, whether it's how, how does one best respond to, you know, being attacked by, you know, um, by the by the uh, the dark forces that are out there. <laughs> <laughs> well, most of the dark forces aren't very well thought out either, so it's not that hard to deflect their yeah. criticisms. And to me, like the things that are going to actually echo, the most powerful things that we've got are visuals. Mm -hmm. So if you show up and you look correct, so you look healthy you have the right attitude and emotion during your interview, that's what people are going to remember. Everybody gets caught up in, re in refuting the science yes. and going into the details, and you're never going to win that. For the most part, TV's terrible at giving that stuff out. People can't process it. They can't remember it. So don't even do it. You know, Don't let yourself get caught in the science trap because right. you'll never get out of it. Yes. You know, Just go right back to, hey, look at me. This is how I eat. If you don't think I look healthy, then don't try this. Yes, Okay, that's great. You know, that's why guys like Robert Lustig have such, you know, ultimately difficulty pushing his his anti-sugar agenda. He doesn't look healthy. Right. And he even admits in some of his interviews he still eats, you know, processed carbs. He says he gets up every day and eats a bagel. I'm like, well, you're a terrible spokesperson then. Right. You know, at least on, like, I looked at your... Ah, keep doing that. I, uh, I looked at your website, okay, and you've got these sort of semi-ubiquitous uh, guy in shape, shirt off picture right. it, with a very pretty woman, you know, with you, which is a great touch. That's by the my way. wife. I always, yes, I figured. <laughs> I hoped. <laughs> it, took, it, it was. If, it's a. It was a battle. It still is. <laughs> no, you've got to though. Like it just looks weird when there's somebody. I don't care if they're in shape or not, but they're standing there with their shirt off all by themselves. Yeah. At least you've got a pretty woman hanging on you. And you're like, oh, there you go. There's a reason why I have the shirt off. It looks like they're having fun or something. I don't know. But thinking about your visuals and getting professional you know, advice on how to present yourself, that's the strongest thing we can do. You know, When I do interviews like this, I end up talking about kind of the rhetoric side of it and the information side. But what really gets people to come and listen to me is the comedy. Sure. You know, and if the comedy's good and I come across as funny, the people are like, oh, I want to go see that or I want to buy this guy's DVD of, of his show. And uh, if not, if it's mediocre humor, which is what most people do when they're trying to sell something, then it's not going to be effective. Sure. Fantastic. That's that's uh, that's yeah. Great stuff. 
Great stuff. Well, um, the um, the humor part now for someone who is uh, for someone who is not funny, um, then they would would they is there any anything any t well or someone who thinks they're not funny, how would uh, is there any tips about using humor or should they just stay away from it? No, I think, you know, I, I, I have another service. Like I've always, I'm a comedy writer and I'm, I've taught comedy and I've been a professor for a long time. So like I, I have a service called Dan Mentors Comedy Writers. Mm -hmm. And it's for people here in Los Angeles and all around the world really who are interested in learning how to write professional comedy because most people never get trained in that stuff. So like when they say they're not funny, that may be true, but you'll find like if you just know the techniques, you can write funny script. And really, once you have the script, then you just say the jokes over and over again. You don't have to be funny in the moment. So it goes back to getting professional, professionalizing what you do. So if you're not funny, hire somebody to help you write jokes. So you've got you know 10 or 15 great jokes that you know work every time, and you can use them if the media wants to interview you. You know, and uh, to me, it, it's it goes back to like if you want to if you want to have real effectiveness then you need to be professional at every level of it right. so I, w I would never give people advice on their their visuals you know i would bring somebody in who does hair and makeup and and as a visual artist to really kind of figure out what the way you should look right uh, but i would definitely give people advice on comedy fantastic so um if if you were um um if you were going to be talking about um as part of your, and I have not seen your talk. In fact, I don't know if it's, if, is that something that's on YouTube or is that something that one could get just by, uh, with a DVD or how does, how would that? Yeah, I have a, it? I have a website, healthycomedian.com mm -hmm. and it's got a seven minute uh, clip from my show, from the 75 minute show that I do. And uh, people can email me and they can, uh, they can get a link to the full show. Uh, but you can email, email me through the website and, uh, I don't mind letting people, you know, watch the full show for free. Uh, I'm I'm going to be shooting a full um, four camera professional shoot of it here fairly soon, and then I'll I'll make that available to people. But for right now, to me, it's just it's it's getting the message out, and you can watch clips of it, and then contact me, and and you know I'll talk to people about it. Fantastic, fantastic stuff. So um, Dan, tell tell us if you would. Uh any uh, about as far as your routine itself i'm fascinated by that how long have you uh, been doing that routine does that was that i guess that was after you you know sort of had your own weight loss experience and or how did yeah that i i started like i said i started incorporating a little bit of it into my standard stand-up set when i go up and i'd headline a comedy club i'd talk about it in a little you know three or four minute bit like the snowman joke was the first that i did earlier was yes. the first joke i ever told about losing weight right uh and it's you know it's really fascinating to people when they see that like you can go to my website healthycomedian.com and you can see before and after pictures of me and i look like a completely different person and i had friends who didn't see me during the time i lost all that weight and so they knew me when i was really big and then they knew me you know then they saw me at 175 and they literally didn't recognize me and it's such a fun process because they're very, they're very excited at first. They're very complimentary, like, oh, my God, look, Dan, you look amazing. And then once they start to relax, they always have to insult who you used to be. Right. Always. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I never really wanted to say anything to you, but, man, you were really big. No, I mean, <laughs> like huge. I don't know if you remember. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you're, you're kind of like, you know, a beanbag with feet. You know, like, uh, and they, they keep just – they have to talk about it and it's the same process every time. So when you realize there's a psychology behind all that stuff, then it starts to be fun to, to write about it because people recognize themselves in it. You know, <laughs> that's great. Now what, now you've also, uh, looking at your site, you also, uh, do a podcast, um, and tell us, can you tell us a little about your, about your show as well? Yeah, the podcast is on hiatus right now. Uh, what I was doing, it's called healthy comedian and, uh, I just moved back to Los Angeles about two months ago, so I'm I'm doing some other projects right now. But it was me bringing on comedians who were unhealthy, okay, and also bringing on a nutritionist, a paleo nutritionist, um, yes. and we would advise the comedian on how to change their health. For me, it's all about like I I tell people my stuff is rhetoric, so it's persuasion. Like I teach people how to convince themselves to stay on diets. That's, I'm working on a book with that because to me, 
lots of diets can work depending on what your goals are, but how do you actually get yourself to do it is what interests me. And so I would give people advice on that. The nutritionist would, you know, sort of break down their nutrition. And like I had my friend Lawrence, who was on as my co-host, and he started at 303 the first day we started the podcast. And we did it for six months. And the end of it, he was down to 247, I think. Wow. And it was just basically low-carb paleo, Mm -hmm. you know. And he's a dude, so it's pretty easy to get a dude on a steak-based diet. Yeah, it helps. You know, and uh, but it was fun. And comedians have, you know, interesting takes on everything. The same stuff, but they just have interesting ways of responding to it. So I did that for six months, and I'm going to re-up it at some point. It's just I'm I got so many other projects that I'm trying to finish up right now that it's it's a lot of work. Sure. To do a podcast. Yeah, yeah, we're uh, we're we're getting close to our twentieth interview. We're officially gonna officially this is all going to be launched on iTunes in January. So we're going to try to okay. Uh, this will be coming out then, and uh, in the meantime, we're slowly putting things up on YouTube. But we are we're. We are uh, definitely uh, definitely learning that it's a lot of it's a lot of stuff behind it, and I love the way your your web is laid out. It's really well done, and uh, we're we're in the process of uh, of getting some some update plans right now, looking at some different designers and things. And uh, so I like really like yours. So good. Yeah, I've got a great guy that I work with here in Los Angeles. He has a, a website called Network Studios, the Network Studios. And he produces podcasts here in Los Angeles for um, a lot of comedians, a lot of actors, and things like that. And he did mine when I was still in Austin. So he and he did the website too. He's good. Oh well, well we might check him out. Yeah, yeah you should. He's I, he's crazy. <laughs> that's cool. It's fun. He's to a work comedian with. too. I work with comedians all the time. They all have these secondary skills yeah. you know, that they do, but they're all comedians. <laughs> Yeah, wow! I never thought. You know, I, I think most people wouldn't know that. Um, that uh, yeah, comedians do have other skills. <laughs> yeah, what, what's generally happened with comedians is they bombed out of another career because yeah. they couldn't keep their mouth shut. Right. <laughs> you know, most in most of society, you're you're severely punished for expressing your thoughts. Yeah. In stand up, that's what they pay you for. Right. To say your worst worst thoughts on stage and. Uh, so yeah, once you get in this stuff, it's really hard to go back to being a civilian. <laughs> I bet, I bet. So you get to yeah. I think a lot of now. Do you ever find a lot of what you uh, or parts of what you say is that, is what people what everyone is mostly thinking, but they're afraid to say? Well, there's a lot of license for standups as long as it's funny. You know, I tell people all the time, like otherwise it's just being offensive or insulting, and anybody can do that. But finding clever ways of saying things that other people feel restricted on, yeah, that's kind of the, the fun of it, you know. And I, I write a lot of Twitters. Like you can – I also have a Twitter called Dan Loves Jokes. That's basically – it's all dedicated to just jokes. I, right. I, typically, that's all I use Twitter for is because I, I like to just write jokes during the day. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'll write things on there every once in a while. And uh, it's still pretty tame. Like I don't really write full – on comedy writer jokes because the world can't take them. You know, they literally take things so they, they just can't divorce themselves from the seriousness of things. Like right. with the Ferguson riots here recently and the Bill Cosby thing, and I was writing some jokes about it, and I'm pretty aware of, of not offending too much, but it still offended people. Sure. You know, and then people feel the right, like they have to express their being offended. I'm like, no, just stop following. I don't need to know that you're offended. I get it. So yeah. you don't need to tell me. You know, tell your cat. Right. That, that comedian was so offensive. But don't tell me. I don't. Uh, sorry. You know. well, well, I think my microphone is my microphone is falling here. It's it look it, it's getting droopy. I think I need some microphone Viagra. Yeah, you got some. Yeah, you got a setup there, man. That thing's huge. It is. This is a yeah. It's a it's a um, um, road. Um, you know, road podcaster. It's like the low end of the uh, the low end of the high end, right? <laughs> is what they is what they sold is how they sold it to me, and uh, so we decided to try to get some good some good some good equipment at least to go with uh, to try to make me sound better. So <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great. That's what I said. Professionalizing the media, anything you're going to do, you know, to, to make it more professional is is good because people are not used to uh, adapting to to amateur media. Right. You know, they will not they will not just go, well, like my podcast. I still have people 
who are sending me uh, text messages and, and Twitters about where's the podcast? You know, we missed the podcast. When's it going to start again? I'm like, well, you know, it costs money to produce it. Uh, it costs time to produce it. I had guests on all the time. You got to do all that. There's all this stuff that goes into it to make it, you know, listenable. And sure. I, I will write scripts for it. So I, I just don't have the time right now. If somebody wants to come in and fund it, you know, right. and pay for each episode, great. I'll re up it. But just doing it, it's like, but people don't understand that. There's like, where'd it go? We liked it. I'm like, yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a lot of people that are not quite in touch with reality, with many forms of reality. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Outside of their own. I mean, it's, so, uh, well, hey, let me take a step back um, to, you mentioned something that, that's one of our big topics and one of, the, I think, the, most, the biggest topics in the whole health area, because many times people are, it are uh, when they find the right information, uh, which many many of us do, many people find the right information, but they still don't actually do it. They don't actually keep on doing it. And I think you mentioned right. that was something that you're sort of fascinated with, and you mentioned that's going to be part of a book. Uh, could you give us any uh, any tips on that from from as far as actually you know staying motivated to uh, when when one is implementing you know a new program, a health program. Yeah, there's so many things when you start to look at why people don't follow diets, why they can't stay with them long term, what motivation means. Like to me, motivation is not a very strong, reliable source of behavioral change mm -hmm. because motivation changes, you know, sure. it wanes. It's an emotional state. And so like yesterday uh, was Thanksgiving. So everybody was, you know, picking down at Thanksgiving and they, they ended up feeling horrible and bloated and and so they all have the same reactions, like, I'm never going to do that again. I'm going to wake up tomorrow and I'm going to live perfectly and I'm going to start a diet. And, you know, so that's temporary motivation based on a physical state. Right. So if, if you felt that all the time, then, yeah, maybe that would be a, a strong source of ongoing motivation. But it's not. Right. And right. most so most people will like, I'm going to make, you know, make a statement. I'm making a strong break based on this motivational state. But the motivational state goes away and all the... Uh, the impulse goes away. So how do you look at it and go, my thing is like, what you actually have to do is really sit down and structure your change. Most people just think it's going to happen, but you can actually put things in place that will structure your change for you. And there's lots of things around it, like even just having a relationship that pushes you towards change in a positive way, or sometimes a negative way, but that instead of going, I'm going to do this by myself and I'm going to, you know, lock down, I'm going to ride discipline and will, and that's going to work, which it won't. Yeah. Willpower it's just is not, it's very limited. It's not strong enough and it's too much effort, emotional effort to sustain. So even just that finding somebody else who's going to be an outside source of influence for you to help you change your you know, behaviors and your emotions and your thoughts, that's a great technique that most people don't use. Like your wife, I, I mean, you mentioned her on your website. Yes, you have a very attractive wife. You know, that's a, I would assume, a source of motivation that you know you need to oh, stay yeah. healthy for her. Sure. Yeah. No question. No question. Yeah. Having a, I, I always suggest to people, hey, you know, if you can, um, especially, I have a lot of. Uh, in fact, we're we're thinking of starting a whole another website, which is going to be uh, basically fitness, uh, fitness transformation for divorced guys. Because, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because I've got, uh, it seems like well, over 50% of our, our customers are divorced guys, and they're now ready, they're, they're getting back into the dating world, and they're realizing, hey, you know, you, I mean, as a 40-something guy, it's very, you know, 30-something women are, are quite attractive, <laughs> right. but the, that's a competitive market, and uh, <laughs> you know, real competitive market, and the guy that's been off the market for, you know, eight, ten years, whatever, ever, is usually a little bit out of touch. Do you know? <laughs> oh, you sh <laughs> <agree>? absolutely. <laughs> well, and I tell people, again, if you're studying the, the true psychology of change, the true persuasive structures that actually work, most major tr uh, change occurs with trauma. Yes. You know, that's the, that is one of the most enduring forms of behavioral change, you know, that comes from some type of emotional trauma. And... If you look back at my story, same thing. I got divorced, you know, in my late 30s. And that was when I weighed 300 pounds. And I remember that exact thought sitting there. And I'm like, I'm in my late 30s. Uh, I'm overweight. 
uh, this is not going to be very successful. And so I went to the gym and I sat there on a bike. I felt like hell emotionally and, you know, I felt awful. I'm like, I'm just going to ride this bike for a while and see if I can feel better. And the endorphins start to kick in and you start to feel a little bit better. And so using that trauma to motivate behavioral change is a, is a really strong way of doing it. I call it, you know, it's the divorce diet. It's the trauma diet. Right. And I lost a lot of weight, but it was all starvation and unhappiness. Once, once the major part of the trauma went away, I, I gained the weight back. But that was, that was enough to at least show me that, okay, uh, exercise, and I've always exercised, but exercise in a different way to specifically treat trauma, specifically make you feel better is a different approach to exercise. Sure, sure. Yeah, the whole biochemistry of, of how we feel is, is something we're not aware of a lot of times with, with the endorphins and then with... Uh, with the, there's a lot of, lot of stuff that goes into that. With eating the right foods, you're going to you change your whole biochemistry, and it's a lot easier to, uh, to, to, to feel good. Um, oh, yeah. Absolutely. And, and just being able to recognize that, most people don't monitor their bodies. You know, they just experience it. But once you start to go, okay, I'm specifically trying to do something, and you give people some of the biochemical information – you know, like endorphins, like to know exactly what that is. Most people have heard the word, but we don't really know what any of that stuff means. Sure, you know, that's and, true. And most, most of it's misinformation. It's half information. And people constantly try to operate on misinformation with this stuff. And you're like, okay, well, let's just slow down a little bit. Like Rob Wolf has, what, 260 podcasts on there. And if you listen to them, you will learn a lot oh, yeah. about biochemistry. Yeah, you know, and I'm some... not a scientist. I, I can track it. I can't retain a lot of it. But just listening to it made me go, okay, I'm a I'm a chemical factory, essentially. Right. Like I, I did yeah. a joke once about uh, this is a way to look at yourself as a human being. You are an interconnected series of about 75 chemical factories inside of you. They're all connected. Uh, you're in charge of all of them, and you have no chemistry degree. Good luck. <laughs> Good. Yeah, that's and and then there's all the then we're surrounded by all these food artificial food products that that uh, are engineered to uh, to taste good to give us a a little boost in you know this chemical brain boost it hits our dopamine thing and uh, creates a you know it feels good temporarily and then we want more of it and it's it's like yeah. you know it's all uh, it's all so a lot of those folks are, are way ahead of us on a lot of on a lot of that. Oh, absolutely. And if I'm if I'm uh, giving advice on persuasion, I want to work for the side that has super addiction chemicals. You know, I, everybody's like, oh, you know, you got to get in shape. And you gotta, I'm like, well, first of all, you have to de-addict yourself from the most addictive food ever designed by science. You know, so don't tell me you're going to do that just by going, I'm going to get to the gym. No, right. you're not. You know, as, as long as you're putting that food in your face, you're addicted and you're not going to win. That's why I said first thing is just don't trust corporations. They've created addictive food because that's the easiest thing to sell, which makes sense. But sure. don't let them don't let them do that to you. Sure. Yeah, you can choose. You can opt out. <laughs> it's hard though. I yeah, mean, you're, it's not you're opting with your rational mind. You're trying to opt out against addictions, and I'll put addictions up against rationality any day. Yeah. Oh no. They win ninety no. percent of the time. Yes. Yeah. It is. It is certainly not. Uh, it's certainly not at all easy. I'm with you. It takes, it's, this is what it's, it's, uh, you know, having that, um, ah. oh, no problem. I keep hitting my, uh, <laughs> my headphones no. every time I move. No problem. No problem. Well, Dan, I know we're, um, we've been, we, I don't want to, I don't want to over, over, uh, overstay your time. And, uh, cause we've been going for a little while here. How are you, how are you doing time wise? Oh, I'm fine. I'm uh, uh, I'm just going to go to the gym after this. I'm off today. So I'll, okay. one of the nice things about being a comedy writer is I can I can do it whenever. Okay, fantastic. Well, well, I've got just a few more questions, and then we could maybe wrap up here in in uh, in a, in a little while, short while here. So one of the things that, uh, that I also wanted to ask, just to ask you about um, going back to your, um, you know, going back to your own experience with uh, with weight loss, because one of the this is something else I. You know, a lot of a lot of the folks that are in, a lot of folks in fitness and health and nutrition have never really been out of shape. 
you know? Right. Um, and so it's harder for us. I had a period where, uh, a number of years back, where I felt like crap. I had some, it turned out to be some hormonal issues and uh, some content, some toxicity issues. Uh, I started, I was, you know, was getting, was getting, uh, gaining body fat, was certainly out of shape, but was not, uh, but to have a major transformation like you, man, that's, uh, you know, really hats off to you. And, and for people that are, uh, to help us understand, for people that have not had that kind of transition, what would be some of the other tips that, that a professional like myself would, would be, would, you know, might be good to know to, uh, to help someone who is, you know, 300 plus pounds? Well, I think, and I, and I talk about this a little bit in the show, to realize that this has been a lifelong issue for most people. That I, I, I'm from Kentucky, which is always one of the bottom 5% health states in the country. It's always low. I tell people, you know, they need a, a CSI detective show for Kentucky. It just every episode would be like cause of death, gravy. <laughs> <laughs> you can find your killer by driving up to the second window, you know. Uh, and I was always overweight from from the very, you know, I was a big baby. By the time I was six weeks old, I was wearing a Tuzi, um, which is a great joke if you're a parent. <laughs> Because babies wear onesies. So. Once, oh, okay. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> uh, I grew fast. By the time I was four, my first birthday, uh, my fourth birthday was at the Cheesecake Factory. Not a, not, not a restaurant, the actual Cheesecake the Factory. The actual, wow. Um, so, you know, I was always overweight. It's been a lifelong thing because that's the way I was fed. Sure. And all, all of my associations, all of my memories are wrapped up with that food. So my attachment to that food was deep. And I think most people who haven't been overweight don't understand just how many attachments people have to their food. And so just asking for rational food change to get health improvements, it's really not a strong enough approach. You know, you have to replace uh, those emotions with new attachments to new food. And that's why going to for me, joining the paleo community in Austin was huge because they have a lot of potlucks where people right. would bring this great food. Right. And it was always fun and people were always upbeat and they're really interested in food. And I started developing new emotional attachments. Right. So doing that side of it, the emotional side of it, I think most health professionals, especially if you've been in shape, they want to focus on the behaviors right. and, and the food plan. But they don't do a lot for emotions at all. Yes. And without that, people are not going to be able to stay with uh, behavioral change. So I think some of that would be really useful. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The whole, yes, the social support that uh, if you can get, get get into a community aspect like you were able to do there in Austin, that's, uh, that's yeah. awesome. It's massive. I mean, the, the, the difference, like I remember taking my kids, like getting changing kids is really hard because my kids are half time with their mom, half time with me. So they go over there, they eat standard American food. You know, she gets some pizza and, and all that kind of stuff. And they come with me and I won't make that stuff anymore. Uh, but taking them to the paleo things, like somebody made paleo cookies and paleo fudge. And they're like, oh my God, this is great. Yeah. And when they actually realize that it was good, they make those emotional attachments to the pleasure of that food. And now they ask me for it. You know, yeah. so you've got to you've got to be able to compete with that other food. Uh, and and then people create their attachments to this new food. And you watch paleos, man. You watch how they react to bacon. Yes. I mean, I mean, that's a that's a mother child reaction. <laughs> you know, that is deep primordial attachment to their food. And that's what you really need. You know, if people are going to stay with this. Yeah, that's a the, I, the bacon is. Uh, someone made a joke once that bacon is the the uh, the starter food for a uh, for a vegan for a vegan <laughs> to, yeah. to break out. <laughs> it's absolutely a gateway food. Or gateway yeah. food, yes. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> and how about now? As far as and you have you have one child or two or I have a daughter, fifteen, and a son who's twelve. Yeah. So we need tips for parents that are trying to you know. There's many many divorced parents and and. Uh, and I think you just gave one great tip, you know, try to get them, get them into an environment where they can, they can actually have, you know, 
be around and eat people eating delicious, healthy food. Any other tips for parents out there who are trying to help their kids, you know, be healthy? Yeah, get a slow cooker. I think, you know, you've got to make food easy when you're a parent because you don't have time to cook. You're tired. There's all sorts of things, you know, that are going to impede you cooking. But you've got to cook really good food in order to sway kids. You can't give kids mediocre food and then, you know, tell them to change the way that they eat. They're just not going to do it because kids are just sensory. That's all they really want is somebody who hits the right sensory buttons. And that's why, like, breakfast cereals, they know all this stuff. Just dump sugar in there and the kids will react to it. So you've got to compete with that. So you got to learn how to cook. Uh, And for me, it was getting a slow cooker and learning, you know, four or five really good recipes. So when the kids eat it, they're like, this is great. And when I come, you know, when I have my kids, they ask for all that food. They request very specific things like, can you make that again? Can you make that again? And it's all super healthy food, but it tastes really good. So that's with kids. It all starts with taste. You can't, they they could care less about health. They don't understand what health means, but they understand whether it tastes or not. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great tip. And it's true. You've got to compete with those, those highly uh, flavorful artificial flavors that are out there. And yeah, <laughs> like Cheetos. I mean, where, where's orange food in nature? Other than like an orange, maybe I guess. But that stuff just doesn't occur anywhere else. Macaroni and cheese. Right. Where's orange dust? <laughs> where do you, where do you find that? Yeah, that orange dust is some scary, scary stuff there. Very yeah, but it tastes amazing, and that's it, what it everybody's. Does. That's literally like Cheerios and macaroni and cheese are the first two foods that, what, 90% of this country eats? You know, you talk about old associations. You give a kid super salted, crazy, you know, orange food as his first food, and then you expect him to get off of it when he's 25. That That's a bad idea. We're yeah. addicting babies. Yeah, no question. No question. And, uh, well, let's... Dan, this is uh, just one more, one more thing I wanted to, to ask sure. you about is, is let's uh, just to kind of wrap things up. This has been, we've, we've gone all over the place. This has been really a, a ton of fun to, uh, to be able to, uh, to talk about so many different things. But one of the things that I see as a, you know, as a, as a professional in this is, uh, and one of the things I, was, I started this, con- this whole conversation tell- saying that I was really excited to talk to you because, you know, I think we need more humor. I think everybody, right. I, think take, I think one of the biggest problems we have um, throughout America, throughout the world, is just taking things too seriously. So, um, so with, with regards to health, um, you know, one of my things is I'm trying to get people, don't let perfection be the enemy. Perfection, in fact, is I always say perfection is the enemy of progress, and from so I'm sure you've heard that one. Right. So, any tips on on uh, or any ideas on that yourself that uh, that you could you know to about how to implement humor into your healthy life? <laughs> well, for a non I mean, things... for a non comedian, you know. <laughs> right. To me, like it goes back to the emotional connections you have to food. Like, we're an inter- entertained gener- culture. I mean, we're an entertained species now. Sure. That's what we've done. We get all our information through entertainment, essentially. Uh, we, we, we will seek out entertainment constantly for the stimulation of it. You listen to music. You, li- you, know, you watch TV. You watch podcasts. You look at YouTube. You do all these things to constantly uh, entertain yourself. So you're like, okay, that's become a very, very powerful modality in human experience. So... Everybody tries to counteract it with things like meditation, you know, and yoga and slowing down and getting out in nature, which is probably good, you know, to sort of de-addict your brain from stimulation. Sure. Uh, I've never been able to do that stuff very well. Uh, My brain is way too spongy. It likes to be stimulated all the time. So instead of trying to slow that down, I sort of turn into the curve where I'm like, okay, I, I want to be entertained for my information. And even if it's paleo information, fine. Uh, then make that entertaining. So like with my kids, my daughter gives me grief because I'll I'll heckle other foods. <laughs> <laughs> she'll, she'll ask for something, and I'm like, oh, you want the orange dust, do you? 
you know, maybe we should find something purple that doesn't exist, you know, in the world and sprinkle that all over the food. And <laughs> she gets to the point where she's like, fine, you know. <laughs> uh, so that's part of it. Not Instead of lecturing people, just turn it into some type of joke. Right. You still get the information across that this is bad food for you. And, and to understand that persuasion is never done in one single shot. It's always little pieces of things that you leave with people. And eventually, it'll get to the point where it's got enough persuasion to, to get some type of thought change. And then some emotional change and finally some behavioral change. And so humor is part of that. You know, yeah. when people leave my show, they are going to have a hard time not thinking about Velveeta the next time they go to eat Velveeta. <laughs> that it's, they, they will. You know, uh, and I tell them right up front, I'm like, I'm going to try to persuade you in this show. And you're going to try to resist it because nobody thinks they can be persuaded. But I'm going to put these little darts in you and you're going to think about them whether you want to or not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. I love that idea. So actually, so heckling, heckling the, uh, the unhealthy food. <laughs> You know, it makes me think back to uh, growing, growing up, one of, my, one of my brothers, actually the funniest, uh, one of the funniest people I, I knew growing up, um, uh, was, was constantly heckling healthy food. And so, uh-huh. yeah. <laughs> so he did it the other way. And so, uh, right. yeah, yeah, that's, so he could turn, the, turn it around. That's a great idea. Well, and people have, you know, essentially they have script written for them to attack healthy food, like calling you a food Nazi. Yeah. You know, somebody came up with that at some point and it became strong enough that other people use it. It's like all the food police are here, the food Nazi or the health nut. Yeah. You know, but that's all rhetoric that was established probably back in the 70s during the first health food movement. You know, and people just sort of use it. It's like, OK, you took a heckle at my food. Now let me heckle your food. Yeah. You know, and we'll and we'll see whose heckle is better because they're never using original heckles. They're, they're just sort of carrying forth very simple, easy to respond to. And that's why I said, like, if you are a script writer or a comedy writer like me, like, okay, here are the seven heckles that people will use for healthy food. Fine. Here's very much funnier responses. And so you're ready. You're armed whenever they bring out their stuff to completely uh, obliterate them because you have much better, fresher, more original takes than they do. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. That's great stuff. So if someone if someone were to say you're the food police, or the food Nazis, uh, what would you say? Oh, I don't know. Like if somebody called me food police, I would use food, uh, police imagery. You know, I'd be like, OK, well, then I'm going to handcuff you, you know, to your cupcake, <laughs> you know, <laughs> see how that works out for you. You know, we'll put you in we'll put you in solitary confinement with just, you know, a big vat of macaroni and cheese and let you eat that for three months and see how you feel. <laughs> oh, that's great stuff. That's fantastic. Well, Dan, this is this has been wonderful and uh, stimulating and uh, really uh, and funny. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to getting this up, uh, getting this up on YouTube, and then getting it up on iTunes in January. And uh, just to to recap for people that want to find you and find your material, uh, can you just tell uh, tell us your information again? How people can find you? Yeah, my brand that I typically use for everything is Healthy Comedian. And you can go to add Healthy Comedian on Twitter or my blog website, which is healthycomedian.com. And I have old uh, podcast episodes up there that you can go back and listen to if you want. And I have some blog things. Uh, but mostly what I keep up with is Twitter, the Healthy Comedian Twitter. And I'm always available to be uh, brought into corporations or universities or any type of organization that wants to talk about healthy change. Because it's really the show is the one person show I do is about getting people to think differently about being in charge of their own health. The weight loss was great, but it's really that's just part of it. I mean, there's so many other things with health about improving, you know, your mood and your energy and your sleep and and all that stuff. And I I touch on a lot of that stuff in the show, but it's basically, you know, designed to get people to think differently about the environment around them and, and how to take more control of it. So you can do any of that stuff, but uh, the easiest way is my Twitter's at Healthy Comedian or my website at, at Healthy or HealthyComedian.com. Fantastic, yeah. great stuff, man. So uh, Dan French, Doctor Dan French, this is uh, the Healthy Comedian. Uh, love to have you on again in the future sometime. And, sure. Uh, and good luck on your book. Uh, when does when does any date uh, that you have for completion? Uh, I'm doing a presentation 
next in December uh, based around the book. So I've been doing a lot of work on it right now. So I don't know, hopefully sometime early in the year I'll have it finished. Fantastic. Early in 2015. Yeah. Wonderful. If you need a review on that or anything, anything we can do to get, to help you promote it, let us know and happy to do that for you. Great. Yeah. I appreciate it. This was fun. Yes, definitely, man. This is the funnest podcast, uh, funnest podcast in a while. And uh, so let's stay in touch and uh, good luck with all your stuff and uh, keep up the good work. Yeah, you too. Sounds all good. Right, man. Thanks. Take care. Okay. Have Bye. a good workout. <laughs> Thanks. I will. All righty. Bye-bye now.